Please join me in the opening prayer. God of love, give us a deep love for you so that we can see the world as you see it, feel the compassion you feel, and be a people whose lives meditate your love to others. So open our eyes that we might see what the Good Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the need in others, the wisdom to know what to do and the will to do it. Open our hearts so that we might not walk on the other side of the road from human need. Help us to see your love at work in this world so that we might go and do likewise. In the name of Christ, our leader, our teacher, and our savior, amen. Please join in the hymn of praise.
Well, thank you, bell choir. Tudor just went, love it, love it, love it. trying to make sure we get all the prayer requests in and we thank everybody for sharing those with the deacons we thank the deacons for their hard work yeah i don't know what that too, i don't know what that song was the bell plot choir played but it sure did ring a bell no not a single honk for that joke but thank you thank you now you're not just pity you're just pitying me well there is much going on in the world to pray about so let's first take a few deep breaths and invite God's presence into our hearts and minds. Scripture says that when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays through us and for us in groanings too deep for words. Come, Holy Spirit, come. God of mercy, throughout this election season, we are casting our votes in a world filled with fear. Forgive us for those times when fear of the other has brought words of anger out of our mouths, when fear of opposing views has caused us to put more hurt into the world. Be with us as we vote to bring your love, compassion, and welcome to all people as we vote to bring your justice, healing, and mercy into the world, as we cast our ballots for election outcomes that leave none of your people behind, may your love and forgiveness sustain us, and may your spirit help us to unite once the election is over. O oh God, as COVID-19 cases rise nationwide, we ask for your help again. Thank you for all of our courageous frontline workers. Keep them safe and help our nation to come together to combat this virus. There are many who need our prayers this morning. We pray for Carol and Ray Grizak as Ray is coming near the end of his earthly journey. Fill him with heaven's peace and with earthly courage and be with his dear wife, Carol. We pray for all those COVID-19 survivors who are still experiencing residual health issues. We pray that you would be our healer, be their healer. Give them the energy they need each day to recover. We thank you for Ray and Dory's wedding anniversary on Tuesday, uh, their 30th anniversary. Bless them on that day. Thank you for our wonderful Sunday school teachers for all of their efforts. We thank you for our kids coming to learn more about you. We pray for those who have had positive COVID-19 tests, for Serena and Wayne. We pray for a person battling dementia. We pray for Tim battling gout. We pray for Jeff also struggling with COVID-19. We pray for Cindy battling bone cancer and John with prostate and, and knee issues. And we pray for Maureen and her struggle with cancer. We also lift uh, Dory's brother Pete and his wife Nancy to you. They have been battling extended illnesses for so long, oh God. These are some of our prayers this morning. You know what each of us brought here with us. We share them now with you. Oh God, thank you for receiving us when we come to you. For we come in the strong and precious name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
Well, I mentioned that this month our Sunday school kids are studying the most important parables that Jesus ever gave. Parables are earthly stories with heavenly truths. And uh, this one we're going to study this morning, we're studying the same one that our younger kids are studying. This is, uh, without a doubt, one of the most famous and influential. In fact, the phrase Good Samaritan has, is part of the popular vernacular uh, used by folks who wouldn't even know that that was a parable taught by Jesus. It's found in Luke chapter 10. It goes like this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Other translations call this person a lawyer, but it's not a lawyer in the, in the way that we think of it. This person was a biblical scholar, and their expertise was applying what we would call Old Testament laws to everyday life. And he's here to test Jesus, which is the gospel's way of saying he's out to trick him and, and get Jesus in trouble. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? I read that that's the Socratic method, answering a question with a question. The lawyer answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now those words should sound very familiar because Jesus said those were the two greatest commands in all the Hebrew scriptures. So the, the lawyer to test him seems to have been paying attention and perhaps listening to Jesus' teachings throughout the, the, the weeks or months prior to this. And he knows Jesus' favorite passage and quotes it back to him. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus told him a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I think pity is not the best translation there. It's, it's, he was deeply moved. He felt deep compassion for the man. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses that you have. Jesus concludes, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. May the blessing of God be upon the hearing and reading and understanding of these words from Holy Scripture. Amen. Well, it's such a great story, and it is so grounded in reality and of the experiences of that area. Uh, Jesus' listeners would have known all about this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a dangerous road. I listened to a sermon by Martin Luther King Jr. on this passage, and the way he said it was a dangerous road. I wish I could say it that way, but that's what it was known for in the ancient world. Jerusalem sat on Mount Zion, which wasn't a terribly big mountain, but it was 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho was 825 feet below sea level. Jericho is close to the Dead Sea, which is the lowest spot on the face of the earth. So this road from Jerusalem to Jericho drops about 
over 3,000 feet in about 20 miles. It was very hilly, of course, and rocky with lots of twists and turns, switchbacks. And this made it a, a, a terrible area for robbers, robbers and bandits to hide out in and then ambush those who were coming along the road. And notice it says uh, robbers. It was plural. Well, the man in the ditch appears to have been traveling alone. That was very unwise. It was said back then that was a road that you don't go down by yourself. But let's not blame the victim. It is possible that the priest and the Levite, one of the reasons why they didn't help the guy is they said to themselves, you know what, he deserves it, being so dumb to, to walk this road by himself. Uh, blaming the victim is, is quite popular today, isn't it? Well, then come three characters. It's kind of that classic story, like a lot of classic jokes that have three characters, and the first two are a setup for the third. The first one is the priest. He appears to be traveling from Jerusalem. Although a lot of times when you hear uh, people describe the story and you read in commentaries, uh, they suggest he was going to Jerusalem to do his duties in the temple and that if he touched the man in the ditch, if the man was dead and he touched him, he would be ceremonially unclean and unable to do his duties. The only problem with that interpretation is it says he was going down the road. And that was a, a common phrase that everybody used for coming from Jerusalem down that 3,000 foot drop uh, to Jericho. So he probably came from doing his religious duty, perhaps feeling really good about himself, feeling he'd done his duty. And it is true that if he touched the man, he wouldn't be able to do anything religiously for seven days. So he passed by on the other side of the road. Levites were like deacons uh, in uh, Judaism. Uh, they assisted uh, the priest and, and helped out with all of the rituals and things in the temple. It's possible that this Levite was worried that he would be ceremonially unclean. But he also probably feared for his safety. It was common in this, on this road that one person, would, uh, a robber, would play dead in the ditch. And when somebody stopped to help, another robber who was hiding would jump out and ambush the would-be helper. So it may be that the Levite was thinking about that. It may be that the priests were thinking about that. They seemed to be very concerned with their own personal safety. Helping others is risky, often. Helping others can be messy and tricky. Uh, in the sermon that uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King preached on this, he said this about the priest and the Levite. These men were afraid. So the first question the priest and the Levite asked themselves was this. If I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and reversed the question. The Good Samaritan asked himself, If I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? Well, the Samaritan is the hero of the story, and like a lot of stories and, and parables, there's a surprise ending that it was the Samaritan. You probably have heard that Jews and Samaritans back then did not get along. I learned this week in the commentaries that that went back hundreds of years, perhaps uh, more than 500 years, uh, sort of like the Israeli-Palestinian situation that goes on today. Uh, they were arch enemies. The Samaritans were uh, lived in that area between Jerusalem and Galilee. They lived in the area in between, and they had intermarried with people who weren't Jewish. And so the, the pure Jews in, in, in Israel viewed them as half-breeds and, and a lesser quality of human beings, which is a terrible way to look at anybody. So for hundreds of years, they haven't gotten along, and Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Well, here's some lessons from the story. One is, don't pass by on the other side of the road. People of faith need to be engaged in the issues of our day. Ignoring the issues doesn't make them go away. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, said Christianity helps us face the music even when we don't like the tune. Secondly, don't miss Jesus 
new definition of neighbor. He redefines the concept of neighbor. It's not just our next door neighbor. It's not even just the ones in our neighborhood or even in our town or our village. It's not even just those who are like us, sort of part of the same tribe, so to speak. Anyone in need is our neighbor, according to Christ. And we're to help them, even if they partly brought the trouble upon themselves. The immigrant is our neighbor. The drug addict is our neighbor. The Haitian, the Ethiopian are our neighbors. The earthquake victims in Turkey are our neighbors. The hurricane victims on the Gulf Coast are our neighbors. Don't forget Jesus redefining the concept of neighbor. And finally, there's one more point in this parable. And I had really not thought about this point until uh, I bought a new book on the parables recently and was reading about the Good Samaritan. And it said one of the main points in this parable was to try and see good in your enemy. You know, Jesus had a lot to say about enemies, to love them, to bless them, to pray for them. And here in this parable, he's saying, look for the good in those you disagree with, in those you hold a grudge with. Look for the good. They're not all bad. Don't dehumanize them. You know, Jesus' listeners, some of them would have walked away and said to themselves, you know what? I have known a few good Samaritans. Those Samaritans there, they're not all bad. There's some pretty good ones. I saw in the news this week a couple from Abington, Mass, named Rocky and Tilda Duraco. Love that name, Rocky Duraco. They've been married 34 years. Tilda is going to vote for Joe Biden, and Rocky is voting for Donald Trump. In their front yard, Tilda has placed on one side of the front sidewalk, she's placed Joe Biden signs. On the other side of the sidewalk, Rocky has placed Trump signs. And they even put on top of the sign, his and hers. So the people would know which of them was supporting which candidate. But the couple said this. They said, our love for each other is more important than politics. People need to see this, Rocky said. You can disagree with people and still love them and still be friends with them. And then he put his arm around Tilda and gave her a kiss on the cheek. Believe it or not, that is part of the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan. That there's something more important than politics, more important than nationality, more important than old grudges, more important than tribalism, and that is love. Let's pray. Oh God, teach us to love. Teach us to love this week. Teach us to be grace-filled with those who disagree with us. Help us to find common ground. Help us to work towards that common ground. But help us to work towards that with your love that is in us. In Christ's name, amen. Our communion hymn is on the back page of your program. It's Let Us Break Bread Together on Our Knees. Let's sing it together.
parable of the Good Samaritan, when we think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, we most often put ourselves in place of the Samaritan. And that's totally understandable because Jesus said, go and do likewise. But what if we saw ourselves as the man in the ditch, beaten up by the cruelties of life, bruised by the hardships and the injustices we faced, needing tangible, tender, loving care. Can we see communion as God's tangible, tender, loving care? It's a meal of grace and love. It's a meal that celebrates God's presence with us always. And that presence and love can bind up our wounds and begin to heal our brokenness. In this year of hardship and brokenness, perhaps that's why communion has become even more special to us. Would you grab your, uh, your bread and your cup? Let us pray. Precious, tender God, the man in the ditch found safety, warmth, and nourishment in the inn where he recovered. May this time and place be our shelter. May this bread and this fruit of the vine be our nourishment to give us the healing we need and the strength that comes from you. Bless these elements to our bodies and us to your service in Christ's name. Amen. We'll start with the bread first. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. Afterwards, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed and gave thanks for it. And he gave it to his friends and said, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant that I'm making with you in my blood which is shed for your forgiveness. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now if you make sure you've shared the bread with those in your car. The body of Christ was broken for you that we might be made whole. Take and eat. blood of Christ was shed that we might know how precious we are to God. Take and drink the cup of salvation. The body and blood, the love and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep and preserve us unto everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the name of him who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A closing hymn is I love to tell the story. <laughs> 